Good morning, church family. Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Also, as you came in, you should have received at the door Lord's Supper elements. If you did not, if you would lift up your hand and our ushers will come by and make sure that you have those. Uh, Let me extend the offer. If you are a born again, baptized believer, you are welcome to participate with us this morning. But the Lord's Supper is for those who uh, are Christians. They know that Jesus is their savior. Uh, Otherwise, it is simply bread and grape juice. Uh, But to those of us that know him, it's a very, very important reminder of his broken body and shed blood. And so we will participate in that this morning. And so mentally, beloved, uh, as our minds go through the entire service, right, we, we never want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. We want to be preparing ourselves, okay? Uh, and so you be doing that. Have you ever heard of the Karen people and the lost book? See, the Karen people are a, a group of people uh, in Myanmar and Thailand, And uh, they have a long oral history of stories passed down through prophecy that has gone from generation to generation. And one of those stories is of Yawa, who created the earth and man and woman as uh, our first parents. And the first couple ate of the forbidden fruit, which brought upon sickness and death to the world. But the ancient prophecy goes that there were three brothers uh, who once had a book about Yawa, but they quarreled, and it was tragically lost. Now, the Karen people had a belief that one day a white brother would come and would bring the book back to them and would teach them about Yawa. Now, when the Burmese tried to convert the Karen people to Buddhism, they stubbornly refused because they had such a strong belief in Yawa. You've probably heard of Adoniram Judson, who came to Burma, one of the first Baptist missionaries, who spent seven years laboring among the Burmese people only to get one convert in those first seven years. Now, little did he realize that the Karen people were right there walking by his house every day, waiting for their white brother who would come tell them about their lost book. And and one day, a Karen man who was actually a murderer and a robber came to Judson looking for work. Now, as he came across Judson carrying this book, he was curious about that white man and his book. As you can imagine, Judson preached to him the gospel. And he was amazed because he knew that for hundreds of years his people had been waiting specifically for this. He immediately believed and was baptized, went back to his people and telling them about the white man and the lost book. And they would come, the Karen people would come pouring down the mountains and were baptized by the thousands. Today, Karen people are one of the only people groups in Southeast Asia that are primarily Christians. Now, as we continue our walk through the book of Acts, Luke is going to shift our focus to Peter as Paul sails away to Tarsus. Now, next week, we are going to see Peter given a vision and called to the Gentiles, okay? Our entire context that we've seen over and over is is the gospel going out, outside Jerusalem to the Samaritans, to the Ethiopian eunuch as the defective, Paul as the self-righteous, and that the gospel is for each and every one of them. And as we will see this morning that there are movements of the gospel 
In fact, we will see this morning God performing undeniable miracles, and the result is a wave of conversion, sweeping through cities, light overcoming the darkness, the wind of revival. So listen as I read in verse 31 of chapter 9. I'll read 31 through 35. Hold your spot there because I'll keep reading a little later. Verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. Now, as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There was found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to read any further. (laughs) Stop right there. We'll We'll get to that. I got mixed up. It was so enthralling. I just wanted to keep reading. All right, you guys pray with me, then we'll jump into it. Our Heavenly Father. Uh, We are grateful for your word this morning, and and we long to have you speak to us, God, and to encourage our hearts. God, you meet with us in our worship, in our prayer, and when we gather together around your word, God, we sense and we know that you are here, God. We long to hear you call us your own and to stir our hearts again with affection and love for you. As we move towards the Lord's Supper, Father, we we want to take it in a worthy manner of you, King Jesus. So we welcome you to convict our hearts because when you convict us, you heal us and you encourage us and you give us the strength to walk out in newness of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now verse 31 here functions as a, a summary statement. And in fact, a unit transition in the book of Acts. If you'll recall, since chapter 7 and Stephen's death, the the emphasis has been on the wave of persecution from the Jewish leaders who have categorically rejected Jesus. Now, the persecution throughout Jerusalem was so intense that it caused the church to flee. But as we saw, Paul followed behind continuing to ravage the church, arresting all that he could, all that called upon the name of Jesus, and destroying families, and beating, and even putting Christians to death. Now, in the midst of that persecution, we saw God's hand of protection and intentionality, because the gospel was going out, no longer confined to Jerusalem. And we also saw that Jesus cared deeply for his people, even as they were in the midst of persecution. But suddenly, all of that has come to an end, at least outside of Jerusalem. You see, for three years, Paul's name caused, caused, uh, sent shivers down the spine of believers. But unexpectedly and miraculously, he has been radically converted. And now Luke wants you and I to pause and to consider God's plan how his hand has him been behind it and had purposes for it all. Verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Luke hasn't told us anything about ministry in Galilee, but he wants to include it here. Judea and Galilee and Samaria have enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. So now, six plus years after Jesus' death and resurrection, the gospel is going through all of Israel. Now, some of it was painful. 
In fact, we would say very painful. But the message of Jesus is going out. And now, without the ominous threat of Paul, Luke is going to draw our attention to Peter, who is, he's kind of received the mantle as chief among apostles. And as we will see this morning, God allows him to perform two miracles that purposely parallel Jesus' own miracles. Okay. As you're reading through the book of Acts and you understand that this is, a, this is a new unit, kind of a new section that's going forward, you understand that chapter 10, which is actually what we'll cover over the next two weeks, chapter 10 is the main focus of this next section. And uh, our storyline today will tell us how Peter got in Joppa, but it's a really important question for us to ask. Right before the main storyline of Peter going to Cornelius, we have two miracles paired together in short succession that lead up to this. So our question this morning is, why does Luke include these two miracles right here? First of all, I'm going to answer that with with two statements this morning. The first one, okay? What is striking about both miracles is the way that they parallel some of Jesus' very own miracles. The first one that I've already read is a believer in Lydda named Aeneas who is paralyzed and he has been bedridden for eight years. Now, immediately in your mind, if you're aware of the Gospels, you think of the paralytic who is laying by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. And he was ill for 38 years, lying on his mat, unable to get into the water for his healing. And Jesus comes up and begins a conversation with him, and shortly in that conversation says to him, get up. Pick up your pallet and walk. And so here, Peter is seemingly passing through the area, checking on churches that Philip or others have planted across this region through Lydda. And he comes across a paralytic man. And look at the language in verse 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up. And make your bed. And immediately he got up. Now that story is immediately followed by another. Right? It starts in verse 36. We're told of a disciple named Tabitha. And she lives in Joppa. Now let me give you a map of the region here, okay? So you, you can see that Lida is about 25 miles uh, to the uh, west of Jerusalem, okay? And, and that's the main road. There's a road that goes from Jerusalem to Joppa. So if you continue another 12 miles, you get to Joppa, okay? Peter is in Lydda, and Tabitha is in Joppa. That is half a day's journey on foot, okay? So, so half a day to walk there and half a day to walk back. Now, Tabitha has noted character. Luke wants us to know in verse 36, this woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. As the story moves on, you find out that she's a seamstress who's apparently very charitable to widows, giving them many nice clothes and tunics. Well, as as our story is told, she falls ill and has died. Now, her friends and loved ones, at this point, they did something unique in that they didn't bury her immediately. In the ancient world, a funeral happened the same day of death because they had no means of preserving the body from decay. So normally, when someone died, okay, you would immediately take the body and cover them, apply a spice resin on them, okay? 
it, it, depending upon the time of day, you, you might take them to a cave, set the body there, Okay, and then you would come back the next day and complete the burial by wrapping the body in strips of linen that have been soaked in, in as much as 100 pounds of spice resin. So here, as we read in our context, uh, that they washed the body and then placed her in the upper room, your ears perk up. You say, that's pretty unusual. And you think, wait a second. Elijah carried the dead body of a widow's son to the upper room in 1 Kings 17. And then he laid him on the bed. He prayed over him and he resurrected. Then Elijah comes back and presents the son to the widowed mother. There's also an important story in Mark chapter 5. Where Jairus' daughter is sick. And is lying in the upper room. Now, now Jairus comes to find Jesus. Okay, He comes and finds Jesus along the way. But the girl has died before Jesus can get back to her. And so they send word to Jesus. Hey, don't bother Jesus. He doesn't need to come. But Jesus looks right at Jairus and says, do not be afraid. Only believe. Now, Peter, James, and John alone accompany Jesus to Jairus' house. When he gets there, there, the wailers are there. It's customary when someone has died that, that the community gathers around it. And part of their culture is people would come and they would, they would wail. They would lament for you and with you. Okay? They are there, but Jesus sends all of them out. He puts them out. They laugh at him for it. He puts all of them out, and only the parents and Peter, James, and John are there. Now listen to Mark 5, verse 41. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha come. That's Aramaic, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Talitha come. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. Okay, back to our passage in Acts chapter 9. Because here we are in Joppa. And they've placed Tabitha. One letter difference from Talitha. Okay? By the way, Tabitha is Aramaic. They've placed Tabitha in the upper room. That's unusual. And they send for Peter. A half a day's journey there and a half a day's journey back. And, and Peter immediately comes. And when he gets there, she is surrounded by those who are weeping. Verse 40. But Peter sent them all out. And he knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said... Tabitha, come, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. And calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Now, what is a parent in... Okay, we're asking the question, why are these miracles here like this? Okay. What is apparent is that God is authenticating Peter's message and apostleship in miraculous ways. Okay. You are supposed to, as a good reader, pick up on, oh my goodness, Peter is able to do the exact same sort of ministry or miracles that Jesus did. He is a prophet in line with Elijah and Jesus, and you should listen to him. To ask the question, is this a prescription for how all Christians are to function today, is to completely miss the context. You see, Peter is called in. There were believers there. Peter is called. Call for Peter. Get him over here. And God allows him to raise someone from the dead. 
Because God wants us to see that the apostles had a special anointing, and we can and should trust their accounts about Jesus. All right, second reason, okay? Why did Luke place these two miracles here? All right, as you're reading Acts, should you just gloss over them real quickly and move on to the important chapter 10 about Cornelius? No, why are these two here? Second reason, these miracles are done for the purpose. They have a purpose because what you see that happens after them is the gospel goes out to whole cities, okay? New movements, like they've heard it for the first time, and and this incredible movement of God follows. All right, so reread verse 35 and 42, because 35 is the summary statement right after Aeneas, the paralytic, has been healed. Verse 35 says, And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. They saw him, that that would be Aeneas. They saw that he's been healed, and they turned to the Lord. And then verse 42, the summary after Tabitha has been raised from the dead. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now listen, the location on this matters also. Okay, because Lida, look again at the map, okay, Lida in the Old Testament is Lod, is in the land of Ephraim, and and in New Testament time, it's on the very edge of Judea, along with uh, really where the, the Philistines were, and it is a mixed city of Jews and Gentiles, and Joppa is even further west It is in the original tribe of Dan, but has been Philistine territory, okay? It it was only under David, (laughs) and it is a, only under David was it actually a part of Israel. After that, it it has been completely uh, Philistine, Gentile territory, and it as a city is predominantly Gentile. All right, so piece this together with me back into the context of verse 31. We've read that a couple times, that the church was going throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, right? They enjoyed peace, and it was was being built up. But now we see that Peter is going west of Jerusalem into an area that Jesus never went into the whole of lost Israel, reclaiming the land, if you will. And as he goes, God allows Peter to perform amazing miracles on the par with Jesus. I do want to quickly point out that is, it, it is commonly heard in frontier missions today of miraculous healings and dreams, authenticating the gospel message as it goes to new cities and villages for the first time. And here we see that Peter has healed a paralyzed man and raised a woman from the dead. But what's the purpose of it? That a movement of the gospel took place and many in whole cities Believed. All right, I need you to perk up because this is the point of the, of the whole sermon. One of the most devastating attitudes possible is when believers, when their discouragement turns into fatalism. You say, what's fatalism? It's this idea. That they do not believe in the power of the gospel to change things. This is the way it's going to be. It's never going to get any better. That is that. This is the way things are. Our society is only getting worse. He is not going to get saved. 
she will not turn to God. And they are never going to see anything different. Change is not going to come. Discouragement turned to fatalism. Now, when you think about it, when you think about this area of Acts, this land, these cities, these families for generations, actually, I told you, it's been a thousand years since David, that they once had the light of faith, but they have turned to the darkness, and all they've seen is war upon war upon war, and sins that go all the way back to, you shall drive out, you shall drive the Philistines out of the land, but because you didn't, they will forever curse the land. When you understand this region that the gospel is now sweeping through, it would be quite easy to get fatalistic. It's been that way forever. It's always going to be that way. Beloved, the book of Acts won't let you think that way. It won't. Because the gospel, because the gospel is for all people, that there is no darkness that it cannot light. Because the gospel has resurrection power to rush in and change everything. You can't think that way. Because of the gospel. As we see here, you can't read this and not be stirred up to say, oh my goodness, look at what God is doing. Listen to this quote by John Piper. It's amazing. Jesus Christ is not dead. And he is not distant. And he is not silent. And he is not weak. And he is not uninterested in the world and in the progress of his mission. And in your life, he is alive. And what he began to do in his earthly ministry, he is continuing to do. He is full of surprises for churches and for nations and for families and for individual people. And so we read here in the book of Acts, and the gospel swept through Lydda and Sharon as they turned to the Lord. And in Joppa, many, a great many, believed in the Lord. I wonder if you've heard of the Bajuri people in northern India. I'm sure I'm butchering how to say that, but you can... Accept my apologies up front. In northern India, this section of northern India that you see there is is a very hostile, has been an incredibly hostile area for the gospel called the graveyard of modern missions. There, There are many other Eastern religions that have their roots right here in this very area, particularly uh, Bhagatma Bodhi, who received an enlightenment, gave his first sermon right here in this area. But one day there was a breakthrough. Really, in the last 30 years, there's been a breakthrough, a magnificent breakthrough of a wave of the Bajori people receiving the gospel, but the incredible thing that's happened there is is that God has used that people uniquely and specifically because their language overlaps with a number of other languages in that region, and well, as part of this gospel movement, there there has been this, this deep indigenous movement among their people where they wanted to see the gospel go out outside of their own people and culture. And so in, a, in an incredibly short period of time, they, they started planting churches. In, in the first year, they, they had gone out and planted 15 
churches, and all of it began to happen organically. And as you fast forward in time, that movement has spread to different language groups and different geographic areas and multiple caste systems. And 30 years later, you can actually look at some of the statistics that even in the the, uh, Bajori people themselves, more than 10 million have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But what's even more incredible is that it hasn't stayed within those people, but it's actually spread to at least four other people groups, okay? And in these four other people groups, that it has spread into the millions of the duplication, the reproduction, the movement of God that has spread forward. This has all happened in northern India, in one of the most hostile areas in the world in the last 30 years. When you and I think of uh, places on earth that are devoid of Christ, you might think of the most authoritarian governments where there's no freedoms. In many ways in our minds, these areas are, are like hell on earth, and we think of the Middle East. And because of where we sit in the West, we often think, they don't want Jesus over there. Nothing's going to change. Fatalistic. What if I told you, did you know where where the fastest growing movements of Christianity is in the whole world? Is in the Arabian Peninsula, right there in the Middle East? Did you you know that the church in Iran, that that through political winds and changes and things that are going on, but did did you know and understand that God is doing a massive movement in the Middle East, in areas where, where you and I think we have such, such a distance that we are so separate, we are so other, that in our own minds we do not think that God wants or desires or even why would he want to go to those people? I share that with you because this is what God is doing right now in our lifetime that the gospel can and will continue to change cities and peoples and even nations. And we say, well, what about us right here in the good old US of A here in Bernie? What about us? Well, first off, I want to point out to us that you and I stand here today on the shoulders of great movements that God has done throughout all of history. That yes, faith was passed down through family trees, and all of that is good and right, but revival movements have been massive in history that moved the gospel west, that moved the gospel right to your ears. The Welsh revival, the first and second great awakening, some more recent, like the Jesus movement of the 60s. And some of our, in our very own congregation, speak of the Castle Hills revival in the 70s. Now I'm gonna show you three discouraging graphs. This This was a Barna study on the the state of the church, and this is back in 2020, so before COVID hit. So you can only imagine that I don't think COVID has done that much for the state of the church in America, okay? And as you look at these three graphs, uh, there's something that's very obvious. Let's hold on that one. That top line is practicing Christians. And right about 2009, as we saw with each of the graphs, there has been a massive plummet of practicing Christians, particularly in the youngest generation. Now, it would be very natural for you and I to get discouraged by the trajectory of our nation's spiritual condition. I'm certainly not telling us to be happy about this. But you know what we we must never become? Fatalistic. We must never lack belief in the gospel's ability to change people. 
and to sweep through the next generation. Recent stories, guys, of Asbury's revival lasting two weeks and then spawning to other college campuses that are pretty close to us, Baylor and A&M just down the street. These stories should stir our hearts with excitement and should remind us again and again that the gospel has the power to change our city and our neighborhood and our schools. In fact, Jesus teaches us to pray for that. Before I unfold this, let me clearly state to you, you cannot command God to move. We're about to enter into the difficult tension between God's sovereignty and him responding to our prayers, okay? But with that said, guys, have you ever noticed that the Lord's prayer is a prayer for revival? Have you ever noticed that? Hallowed be your name, Jesus. I want to see your name high and lifted up. And may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God, I want to see your kingdom come here and now. Because I believe that the gospel is what we need and the gospel has power to change lives and God, I want to see it. Guys, how often we get bitter and divided and discouraged and we say in our minds, to hell with this place. I'm going to heaven, to my eternal home and this place can just keep being evil. I'm done with it. Fatalism. But that's the exact opposite of the Lord's Prayer and what we see right here in the book of Acts. As we read it this morning, as you and I should be so encouraged to pray for those that God has placed in our lives. We're going to pray for three lost people. We're going to be intentional about it. And we should be stirred up realizing God And the gospel have the power to move and change lives and eternity. And we cannot be fatalistic and we certainly cannot sit on our hands. With that said, will you take the Lord's Supper? Elements. We will take this together as a family. So I want you to prepare the bread As you have the bread, I want to lead your heart and your mind. I'm going to give you a moment here to confess your sins. Here's the deal. Praise God that you have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And we never want to take this in an unworthy manner. He says, remember that my body has been broken for you, for your sins so that you can come before a holy God, not in your name, in your power, in your strength, but in the name of Jesus. And so in the quietness of your heart right now, would you just do business with him? Whatever he has laid upon your heart and your mind this morning, confess it to him so that we can take this together. I'll give you a few moments. King Jesus, we thank you for your body, that it was broken for our sins. And we confess those sins to you right now. We ask for you to forgive us. 
Give us the strength to walk in newness of life. It's in your name we pray. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now I want you to prepare the cup. I want you to remember the hope of the cup. The hope. That is that you and I leave here having done business with Jesus and you know what? He says you're perfectly clean. We, we leave our burdens at the cross. We leave them there. And we walk out in newness of life. And he's promised that he will not drink this again until he drinks it anew with us that day. But there's also an urgency with it, isn't there? That while today is called today, while there is still time, we have to be sharing that good news, telling others. So I'm gonna give you a few moments as you think about the hope of this cup and the hope that must be shared. taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we thank you for your broken body and your shed blood. We thank you that the good news has reached our ears and that your Holy Spirit opened our eyes and quickened our hearts so that we could see, so that we could know you. Thank you. King Jesus, we want to walk worthy of you. We know, we know we can never measure up to the amount of mercy and grace that you have given but you have placed in our hearts a desire, a desire to walk out changed. So we ask for you to continue to strengthen us and change us as we, as we walk forward in newness of life. It's in your name we pray, amen.